Thank you, Fred. Thank you, and thank you very much for coming. Um, Twitter was never designed to be the second screen for television. But over the years, your, your, your audiences and our users have chosen in their millions to use Twitter to talk about your shows, to share their interests, their passions, about your talent, and all of the content that you create. Now, as we all know, Twitter, sorry, TV is facing some of its greatest challenges that it's ever had. And how the TV industry reacts to those challenges in the next few years is going to affect how audiences experience TV for many, many years to come. So over the next few minutes, me and my colleagues are going to talk through some of the ways in which Twitter have been thinking about TV and been working with TV to find the best ways towards that new audience. Of course, we're going to second screen this as well, so please feel free to uh, use Twitter uh, using the hashtag TVXTwitter, TV times Twitter. And later on, please do follow us on Periscope, where we will be doing a live uh, Q&A after, directly after this, uh, this presentation. So let's look at uh, some of the challenges ahead of us and talk about TV and a little brief history, which we like to call, this used to be easier. So in the old days, back in the beginning, TV was like a track meet. You knew that there were a limited number of lanes or networks. You knew that when the gun went off, the race started. And then when you finished, you reached the end, there was a winner. Simple times. Then it got better. With cable and satellite, you suddenly had almost an infinite number of lanes for your content. And you didn't even have to win in a particular place or time. As long as you got the 18 to 34-year-old female audience, that was it. You had won. Great. However, if you're in the TV industry now, you're probably a little bit like this guy. You're probably wondering what's going on. The audience is fragmenting and shifting. They're no longer watching on a single screen, the TV. They're watching on multiple devices, whenever and wherever they like. TV has changed. TV is no longer a track meet. TV is no longer a cross-country race. It's parkour. The audience is anywhere and everywhere on all sorts of devices that you no longer control. Now, this is actually quite exciting, because this gives you the opportunity to reach people wherever they are, however they are, whatever they're doing. And it's largely through this. This device, not this particular one, don't rush the stage. This, the mobile device is where it has more computing power than they use to put man on the moon. And of course, you can watch that on this anytime you like just alongside millions of hours of other content, from networks to Netflix. And this is a great opportunity. And Twitter helps you optimize for this opportunity and get to the parkour audience. We call it media at the speed of now. It's where people are now. And Twitter supercharges your content to reach people in the now, wherever they are. We are connecting your best content with the best audiences. And when I say the best audiences, we don't mean that in some kind of abstract way. It is, in fact, the fact that Twitter audiences, people who use Twitter, are more active across all platforms. If you look at what they do, they watch more TV and more video on all platforms and all devices. This is a study from Ipsos, by the way. They are consumers and creators of more content across all platforms. And best of all, Twitter users are influencers. Their family and their friends can go to them to find out more about TV. Their voice about TV is heard and is respected. And how does that work even better for, for TV? It's because of the distribution. Twitter is live, public, and conversational. It goes everywhere. First of all, you're looking at over 300 million logged in users to Twitter. You then have millions more who are discovering Twitter content all the time through search when looking for stars or your shows. And finally, there's the syndication of other tweets where millions more people are seeing the tweets about your content and your own tweets about your content on other media. This leads to over a billion people are seeing this content. There's a huge audience, a huge distribution potential for you in the now, media at the speed of now. And because of this, this is why we're working with loads of produ production companies, broadcasters already, to make the most, and as I say, optimize for the mobile experience. Here's a few examples of what we've done so far. This year, 
we worked with the X Factor in the UK to create a Twitter vote for deciding who, which judge would look after which category, for which we created those uh, delightful little emojis as well that were triggered by the hashtags using the vote. In MasterChef Brazil, they have live tweeting throughout the show. You are able to poll through the show. And here at the end, they in fact, what you're watching here is the uh, hostess announcing the winner on Twitter first. It went out, and that spread across Twitter at the speed of now. And in MasterChef in Australia, the, they live tweet all of the stars, all of the chefs backstage to accompany the program when it's on, adding that extra layer, that extra conversational layer, which enhances and augments your TV experience. Of course, Dancing with the Stars is also doing Twitter votes. It also uses the Twitter Vine booth, which is a 360 uh, uh, device that allows people to create great content. And also, this year, where we, in the UK, where we call it Strictly Darling, we uh, introduced Twitter emojis, where people are now allowed to play along and do hashtag Strictly1, hashtag Strictly10, as they go and watch the show and play along on Twitter. By all means, uh, feel free to give me a Strictly 10 for this. Nouvelle Star won't be outdone. They also did a Twitter vote, which was actually uh, sponsored by Deezer. They also put out great backstage content and also have the Twitter Vine booth. We also have the, uh, the Voice. The Voice, of course, introduced the uh, Voice Save, which was the hashtag Voice Save to bring someone out of the danger zone at the end of every episode. Um, they have gone one step further in France, where with TF1 we have partnered to bring the voice box, which is an air, uh, a traveling uh, device where people can log in on Twitter, and they were able to uh, audition right there in this booth through Twitter. Big Brother, Big Brother of course, a, a traditionally very much a sealed, compartmentalized world. They now put a Twitter mirror, an iPad with uh, several sort of technical devices within it, which allow the uh, participants of the house to tweet out, send out save me selfies and all sorts of other communications through that fourth wall. And everyone else can see this guy in the blue, right? That's not just, just me. Um, and finally, not to mention my favorite thing, uh, the Twitter chopper which was uh, used by, uh, in the Netherlands to tour around and, and watch Sale 2015. This sadly is not, uh, is not something that we have in our offices uh, to take us around. We had to take a cab here like everyone else on Sunday. So the question is now, with all of this distribution, with all of this content, how do we get it out there? How do we get it out there? So we've got a little tool book that we're going to put together for you guys now, which is going to tackle the, the three pin pillars of this. Distributing everywhere, creating content everywhere, and monetizing everywhere in the now. So first of all, let's look at that distribution. We talked earlier about those influencers and the fact that Twitter is live and public and conversational. The fact that a tweet can travel very, very far indeed. There's no better example of that than in the, the, the dress. So everyone remember this, this dress? It's white and gold, people. Do not be fooled by what they tell you. This dress was posted on a Tumblr, actually. Uh, by a woman who had 27 followers on her Tumblr site. Somewhere along the line, the BuzzFeed editor found this and posted it in a tweet, as we see here, at around about 5.47 in the morning. By 8.54, it was on the Today Show. This dress traveled everywhere. You could not miss the dress over the period of time. In that now, 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 everyone was talking about the dress. Everyone had seen this dress. And the great thing is, it all came from one tweet. One tweet drove more tweets, and those tweets were then pasted into other platforms, Facebook, Google, Pinterest, wherever you looked, real uh, you know, media, you could not miss it. And by the end, Jonah Peretti of BuzzFeed actually attributes 72% of nearly a million page views to that single tweet. That tweet was the spark that went into the gas tank and exploded and sent that dress everywhere. And that's because of the massive reach, the reach that goes beyond a single tweet that is then propagated and spreads faster than you can possibly imagine. And in all of that, there's all of these tweets, though. We have a billion. There's a lot of billion numbers there. There's a lot of content. It's like TV. There's a lot of content. There's a lot of TV. How do we find the best stuff? So to meet that challenge, Twitter has developed TV timelines. These are the things you may have seen uh, if you're looking at Variety or uh, Mashable. Um, we released these. We're currently testing them on iOS. But it's been described as being able to change the face of second screen viewing. That is because we are wanting to get that best content, your best content, the most influential content, to Twitter users as soon as they possibly can find it. 
So how do we do that? We have a number of discovery uh, techniques in tweets now. When you look through your timeline, if you see a tweet about a TV show, normally that would be a TV show and it would have a hashtag and you would think, okay, I can choose to go through that. We now want to highlight. We highlight with these tweet pivots that actually highlight where the conversation is and will take people deeper into better content and the best content about your show that is on Twitter. These are the show pages and the tweets from the show. This is an area that can be branded by uh, publishers and by, uh, by broadcasters. And we're intending to roll this out to all TV shows over time. At the moment, it's a test, and it's uh, being released in the US very soon. But it will roll out across the entire uh, TV timelines uh, over the next year. And what's more, another great thing is the cast. The cast are some of your most influential and powerful people. The cast and your talent are a channel that you are on on Twitter as much as anyone else. And so when we create these timelines, we have an area where the cast can be found directly. And also, they can be prompted to be followed, so people can follow the cast. And this is great for them. They will feel empowered by this, and they will also be able to take those followers on and use them again and again. So this will encourage them to tweet. And as Anjali will show you later, cast tweeting is an incredibly powerful thing for your shows. So right now, this is quite abstract. But right, right now, if you're on an iOS device, we've set up uh, a timeline for MIPCOM. So you may have looked through Twitter today and noticed any tweets carrying hashtag MIPCOM. Uh, they will be appearing in a timeline dedicated to MIPCOM. And so what you'll see is that you'll be able to click on a pivot, and it will take you through to tweets coming through all around MIPCOM. You will also see cast, which in this case is MIP, and the uh, people working at MIP. And you'll also see media the media that's coming through there. And as you can see, of course, we're seeing uh, a large number of, of pictures from the floods on Saturday, which uh, I think, you know, full credit to MIPCOM and the people of Cannes for uh, pulling this amazing show still together and uh, working with us so well. So this is a great chance for you to discover and for your audience to discover more content on Twitter and get your best content in front of that best audience. Now, how do you create that content, which is optimized for Twitter? My colleague Fred will now tell you more. Yeah, so, so you see now this kind of enormous distribution reach that Twitter has. And, and it exists on our platform and off our platform. It exists kind of beyond geography, beyond distance, beyond time. As the audience shares it, as that parkour audience grabs it, carries it, shares it, engages with content, sends it off to their friends, right? That's what we mean by media at the speed of now, right? So, what we're going to talk about now are ways for you, broadcasters and producers and creators and publishers, to get that content onto Twitter really easily. And we've evolved our platform so that you can do that. One of the big bets we've put down, as you might guess from this, this nifty slide, is on video. We've really spent a lot of time evolving video over the past six or eight months. And we're continuing to do that. We have created a native video platform that makes it very easy for you to upload things onto our server and share them onto Twitter. We've improved our Snappy TV platform, which is the platform you use to do live editing and send out to a tweet in a matter of, of just a minute. Of course, we've continued to evolve Vine. And the users of Vine have, are creating a new vocabulary. They're creating a new way to engage with millennials. They're creating a whole new set of creators that are, are, are completely invigorating this video world. And our new acquisition, Periscope, allows people with just the push of a button to broadcast from their iPhone to the entire world. All of the Twitter video work that we do takes into account the television industry. We have always set ourselves up as partners for you. Right? So we're always thinking about the content that you generate, all the great storytelling that you do. And we're figuring out how to get that on our platform in ways that our users will really appreciate it. So we think about your behind the scenes clips. We think about custom integrations. We think about replays. We think about exclusive camera angles, all of that stuff. We're always trying to figure out how to get that on our platform. And the big bet that we've, we've made over the past six or eight months is really beginning to pay off. For one thing, video views on Twitter over the past six months are up 
And of those video views, 90% of them are on mobile. We've established a, a, an audience platform that, that Dan you know, described to you, the reach of the Twitter platform, so that now a piece of video on Twitter can reach 700 million people. And the big news is 370 years of video are now watched every day on Twitter. So the big bet is paying off. The other thing that's really interesting about Twitter, as we've done research, and this is a, a study from Research Now, is that our users overwhelmingly tell us that they come to Twitter primed and ready to discover new video. So if you've got a TV show, if you have a network, on YouTube, people are going to go search for your clip because they already know your clip exists. They already know your show exists. Twitter is where you can go and find new audiences and where people are looking to discover new content. So I talked about the different platforms that we have, Snappy TV and our native video platform, and how you can use them to easily put content onto Twitter. And this oversimplified slide here shows you that you can take a moment, you can take the feed from your live show, run it through literally a laptop with a browser, editing capability in the browser, and send it out not only to Twitter but to other social platforms in a minute. Right? It's a process that used to take hours digitizing for different platforms, cutting, trimming, getting it ready. Now you can, a moment goes to a tweet in just a minute. Our native video platform is for people who have produced content, right? So you have scripted shows, you have pre-taped shows. You can take those shows and put clips of up to 10 minutes in length, put them onto the platform, put them onto the native video server, and time them so they can come out before, during, and after your broadcast. You can engage the parkour audience any time they're interested in talking about you. And then you can press the wrong button and it'll take another minute. <laughs> so when you think about media at the speed of now, when you think about now, there's nothing more now, obviously, than live. Periscope is a game changer. It really is. Now anybody with a phone can broadcast to the entire world. And if you're a broadcaster, if you're making television, you can share the fun of making your shows with the audience as you're making them. This example from The Ellen Show is perfect. The, the phone here belongs to her producer. He sends out a tweet that says, we're on Periscope Hi, right now. We're live streaming to this people is Ellen's on -air all demo. over the world right now. Whoever's watching from all of say, he say hello to everybody right now. OK, who are the people that called in sick again? I forgot. I just want to get closer to see who called in. Right, so that it, how, look how immediate that is, how tactile it is. You're holding it in your hand. You're talking directly to the audience. In just the few months that Periscope has been live, we have seen amazing integrations, behind-the-scenes tours with The Voice, live music from Fête de Musique, hundreds of Periscopes from Eurovision. We've seen newscasters Periscope with their audience during the commercial break. By the way, incredibly smart. If they're holding the phone, they're not holding the remote. They're not going to change the channel. The interesting thing about Periscope also is if you see those little hearts and those little questions on the side, Periscope is video that's conversational. It's two-way. It really engages the audience. So they can tap the screen that they like something and it produces a heart, or they can type in questions that the person on the other side of the phone, on the other side of the screen, can see. Periscope is catching on like crazy. We do 40 years of Periscope content that are watched every day, right? And it is growing and growing and growing. It's a game changer in the same way that Vine was a game changer a year and a half, two years ago. What Vine has done is created a new vocabulary for short films. Those little six seconds of joy and entertainment are, are the key to millennials' hearts. They love to be entertained and delighted by Vine, and it's creating a whole new way of, of engaging with that audience. We're seeing amazing creative work from our broadcast partners, like this Vine from the European Movie Awards from MTV. I have a little acid flashback every time I see this. Wow. Um, this is nice. Comedy Central UK did this for National Kissing Day. It's a spin the bottle game. And 
and we'll see who I go home with tonight. Um, the great thing about this, by the way, th what other platform gives you video that you can touch and stop and start? Right? That was the fun of playing that spin, spin the bottle game. Then this is one of my favorites. This is the Australian Film Festival tribute to Star Wars. Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. Oddly enough, I hear that the new Star Wars movie is actually made completely in cardboard, which is going to be disappointing for people, I think, when they show up. So we see vines being used by The Voice, by Let's Dance in France, by shows all over the world. 1.5 billion Vine loops are watched every day. 200 million people watch Vine every month. Those are great ways to publish the content that everybody can do. The other thing that we've really been working on is ways to get behind the scenes, on the red carpet, everything else. So Dan referred to the Twitter mirror, right? We've taken that software and we're evolving it. These shots from the, uh, from the MTV Video Music Awards shows you a Twitter mirror that includes stickers, that includes writing on the screen, that can create GIFs and memes. The other thing that we did, and I just want to talk about this because we're always evolving these ways to work with you, something called the Twitter Challenger. We thought to ourselves, wouldn't it be interesting if a celebrity could approach the mirror and instead of just posing for a picture, we actually asked them a question. Rap your favorite song. Do your favorite Donald Trump impression. Or do the whip nay nay dance. I don't know if it's caught on here in Europe. Everybody's doing this dance. It's the dance of the summer. And we did something with the Teen Choice Awards this year. And we asked celebrities to do the whip nay nay dance. We vined it out. It made great content on Twitter but it also made great content on the air. For those of you who have been living under your bed, the whip and the nay nay is the hottest dance of the summer. Oh, a little bit of that? What's going on, a little bit of that? The stars are dancing out at the Twitter Challenger on the blue carpet. Check them out and tweet with the hashtag your favorite whip and nay nay video. Here are some of them. Hey. Now watch me whip. Hey. For just a second, I thought that guy was getting up to dance. It was great. I was like, oh, awesome. He's into it. All right. We're also working on new ways for our users to express themselves and to work with your shows. This is an experiment we did with Sports Center. They created a poll. People could vote, write, and tweet. And that poll ends up on the, on the air. Um, and finally, in terms of our evolution, uh, two nights ago here at MIP, uh, we shared an award with Orange in France for the TV social, social TV innovation of the year for our Watch With platform. And this is incredibly great. We're working with Orange. We're also working with Comcast in the US. We're working with device manufacturers. So here's the big idea. We're talking about this layer of conversation that we've all created together around television. What if that layer of conversation could become the program guide? You no longer had this long scroll of squares in front of you, but in fact, you tune into TV, and it's, what are your friends watching? What is Twitter watching? What are people saying about this show? So that's, that was the basis of the Watch With experiment. We shared an award with Orange, and we were incredibly excited about it. So as I said, we think all the time about workflow and process. How do our products, how do the things that we work on, fit into your production cycle? Before, during, when you're live, and after the show. So when you're constructing your shows, when you're designing them, when you're in pre-production. Make content on Twitter, make content on Periscope, make content on Vine. We know that it works. It works. How do we know that it works? Well, fortunately, our director of global media and agency research, Anjali Mita, is here to tell us. <laughs> Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Um, really excited to be here. As Fred mentioned and as Dan mentioned, you know, we have been basically telling you guys all of the amazing ways where you can bring your content onto the Twitter platform or create new content specifically for that parkour audience as we talked about. I'm here to tell you a little bit about 
monetization. So I don't know if that makes me the most exciting or the dullest part of this presentation, but we're going to talk dollars and cents for just a couple seconds because I want to really uh, show you guys that, in fact, we're studying how this is working, and we truly do believe that, that this is a win for all of our partners. So basically, this is not a surprise to you guys. I'm sure many of you have seen slides like this in the past. We know that prime time is a special time of day. We know that we can collect massive audiences in front of our TV sets uh, in those magic hours towards the end of the evening. But what's really remarkable is that both internet and mobile are going up at the same time. And what that actually tells us is that there's more meshing behavior now than ever before. Meshing, of course, is when you're using multiple screens to kind of create that holistic media consumption experience. So you're on Twitter or on another platform while you're watching TV. At the end of the day, though, meshing all of that activity, what does it mean? What it means is that people are talking about your programs. And what we've done is we've actually begun digging into the best ways to create more of that conversation. And we're going to talk in a second about why building this conversation is so important. But for a moment, just to kind of take a step back, what are the types of levers you have at hand that can immediately make an impact on the levels of conversation you're garnering? First and foremost, live tweeting. Uh, we're actually doing some live tweeting ourselves today, so for those of you who are checking it out, feel free to check out the MIP timeline and you'll see all of our live tweets. Basically, this is the practice of having you, your show handles, your talent handles, uh, contestants, tweet while the show is actually on air. That creates a remarkable pull for the audience to tune in live and in real time because they don't want to miss that uh, online experience. Rich media. So being media forward, we've seen so many wonderful examples of video and photo, vines, periscopes, truly putting a rich media experience out there. It's unbelievable in terms of what it does for engagement. So we might have started out as a text-based platform, but what we're seeing today is that any and all types of media can actually attract users to, the, to your content. And so we really encourage you to think about creating special content for folks. And then the last one, which is actually my favorite, is a lot of times we think of TV as my show's airing here at 8 o'clock, and then I got a break. And then it airs again next week at 8 o'clock. There is no break. We know that there's no break now. People are watching on their own schedules. They're watching it wherever they want. Uh, and now we know, we've actually looked into it and seen that roughly a third of all conversation between your programs is anticipation for the next episode. So that's an invitation for you guys to get involved and actually create more of that anticipation, get people more excited uh, for what's coming up next. But why does conversation actually matter? At the end of the day, we actually have done an experiment with our partners over at Fox to learn that when people see things, and this is again probably not a surprise to any of you in the room, but when people see things, it actually makes them do things. They, they change the channel. They will look something up online. So what we wanted to do is go beyond conversation. So we've kind of shared with you guys, OK, here are all the things you can do to build that conversation, but what's next? What can you do on top of that? So what we did is we actually ran a tune-in experiment with Fox for the program Empire. In our defense, when we chose the program Empire, it was well before any of the episodes had ever aired. So we had no idea it was going to be quite as successful as it was. But in retrospect, we're very lucky that we got to run this experiment with such a phenomenal program. So as you can see, we have our live tweets. We have total tweets. So the difference here is live tweets are actually happening around airtime. Total is happening over this entire Q1 period uh, earlier this year. And then you can see that we're well over half a billion impressions. So that's a huge huge audience, 32 million people seeing tweets about Empire on the platform. So what can we do with those individuals? What we actually did was we took all of the folks who were live tweeting, who are in this first ring, and as you see the cascade effect, we have this audience now, the 32 million, if you will, that are actually exposed to what was happening. So the scientific term I use now is this is the audience that's ripe with FOMO. They're seeing all these tweets. They're not really sure if they should actually check it out. What we did is we actually served an impression to those individuals, reminding them to tune in or to catch up. And the way we flighted the media, just briefly, uh, to give you guys a sense of it, was 
tune in on Wednesday. Definitely watch tonight was uh, running on Wednesdays. And then of course, don't forget to catch up. And we gave people opportunities to watch those episodes on various platforms so that they could actually tune in live the next week. So really interesting experiment, which I don't know, for those of you guys who are paying attention, you might notice that you're actually only paying for that second or possibly the third or fourth impression. So the first bunch of impressions are being generated for you by your audience. Uh, so that's a really interesting sort of uh, financial benefit. What we actually saw was by far the strongest lifts in intent to tune in, either live or time shifted, that we've ever actually recorded at Twitter. So, and as a researcher, <laughs> you know, I'm waiting for someone to beat our record here. But uh, as you can see, these lifts are quite phenomenal. And just to kind of break it down, what you see in that first kind of light blue column are the people who saw nothing on Twitter at all. They were not exposed to any impressions at all. But you can see that there's already a pretty high intent to view, and that's because, of course, Umpire was a very highly talked about program. It was very uh, well known. The second bar is people who only saw the tweets from their friends and family, so just the regular old earned tweets. And then that last bar is the people who you just tapped once with that extra impression, and you see what the step change looks like for those individuals. So just giving them that reminder to tune in or an opportunity to catch up was super important. When you put all this together, we actually uh, ran some sort of back of the envelope calculations, if you will, and we recognized that about one in seven people who received that, uh, that extra impression, uh, we were able to change their hearts and minds and get them to actually acknowledge that they wanted to tune in and catch up on this program. So really very phenomenal results. But at the end of the day, what is TuneIn, frankly? TuneIn is a proxy, right? It's a proxy for revenue. At the end of the day, we're here to produce the best content in the world, but somebody does have to pay for it at the end of the day, right? So what we actually did is we kind of took a different approach. What we wanted to do is just simply see, do higher social programs actually command higher prices? So we can, you know, on the one hand, we know we want to be driving tune and we want to be driving these desirable behaviors. But on the other hand, is it working? Are you guys putting your efforts in the right place? As you can see, when you control for everything, including rating and age, you'll, you'll notice that across the board, more social programs are commanding slightly higher prices, particularly for that youngest group, which, of course, once you see the data, you're like, oh, okay, that makes sense. Uh, we kind of had the same reaction. So as you get into the older demographics, the, the change is a little bit less pronounced. But with that younger audience, really, it's, it's an important thing to be able to demonstrate that you not only have a younger audience, but that they're very engaged with your program. Uh, we've actually gone ahead and been able to begin alpha testing a product that will allow us to do that Empire tune-in experiment at scale. Another product which I want to share with you today is actually our Twitter Amplify product. Many of you have probably heard about Amplify, but briefly for any of you who haven't heard about it, basically it allows you to take your great content, tie it to your sponsor, and bring it onto the Twitter platform. So no one is saying, just put your content on Twitter and don't worry about it, it'll be good for you. There is an opportunity to actually bring that sponsorship with you onto the platform. And we are really excited, actually, because I know we've talked about Amplify, and I believe we talked about it last year, too, uh, where we shared with you that we were working on things, but we've made huge, huge advances in the past year. Not only have we gone from regional to global, so this program is now available everywhere, we've gone from manual to automated. So now not only can you bring the core TV sponsor with you, onto the Twitter platform. We're also developing what we call a content marketplace, which means even if you don't have a key sponsor for your program, you can create the content and make it open for any sponsor to come in and, and basically promote for you. We also have moved away from simply being uh, kind of hovering around big events and sports. We are now essentially always on with many of our partners, and we are looking at all content from series all the way to the biggest tent poles and the biggest anchor events throughout the year. We're working with about 200 premium advertisers already, and actually it's kind of hard to share this number because it changes literally every day. As you guys bring better and better content onto the platform, this number goes higher and higher. So the advertisers that you all seek to work with, they're ready and waiting for you guys to bring your content to the platform. Here's a good example of actually how Amplify came to life most recently at the MTV VMAs earlier this year. I just 
and I'll spare you from having to hear Taylor Swift's introduction of Kanye West, but simply share with you guys that basically, as your audience is fragmenting, as they see things happening live, they want to share this with their friends. Why not make it easier and actually have that sponsorship carry forward so that the folks who aren't watching it on the big screen are able to actually watch it on Twitter, if you will, with that sponsorship attached so you guys are being responsible with your content. We know that this works. And that's, I think, the most important thing and one of the reasons why I wanted to share this with you guys today. We have new research that actually helps us understand that when people see Amplify tweets on the platform, so these rich video tweets, their emotional response is 28% higher. And we know that emotionality, this is a study we actually did with our partners over at Mashworks, you might also hear them referred to as Canvas, uh, where we know that actually emotional responses are predictive of future tune-in and also uh, essentially influence on other folks. So more than just saying, I'm watching something, when someone actually says, oh my gosh, this is the best thing I've ever seen, it has that much more influence on others. Similarly, for all of our brand partners, we know that there's also an impactful lift in sales. Not a huge surprise, because the sight sound motion that they're used to getting on the television is now being brought forward and is available on Twitter, just the same way your content is. And with that, I want to actually uh, bring up my good friend Justine, who heads up media partnerships for France. She's actually got a special surprise for all of us, so I'll turn it over to Justine. Thank you, Thank you very much. <laughs> all right. So for those who are already attending last year, we wanted this year to welcome a guest, a personality, who embodies a lot of the messages we have been talking about today. How can I use Twitter to be discovered? How can I create content that engages and reaches the maximum audience daily? How can I capture that public on the move? And so, we decided to invite a former heart surgeon. But this heart surgeon is featuring in the Time Magazine top 100 most influential people in the world. He's a resident fellow of the Kennedy School of Government of Harvard. He's probably one of the most revolutionary broadcasters of the Middle East. Uh, with over five million followers, he knows a bit about that parkour audience as he has to do a little parkour running for himself. And so before we welcome him on stage, I would like you to watch that little introduction because all his story started with the height of the Arab Spring. By the time the revolution was ending on the squares and streets of Cairo, another revolution was starting in the most unlikely location in the laundry room of the apartment of a young cardiac surgeon. With one desk, one camera, trying to imitate a show he was addicted to for many years. Yes, this young doctor thought that just by commenting on videos, using fast editing, sound effects, over-the-shoulder photos, and even on-location reports, that he could make a political satire show. And in less than two months, and with only seven videos, our channel made five million views. A figure unprecedented in Egypt, and instead, of just staying as an internet phenomenon, we made the next big leap. We made it to TV, and we made a lot of noise as we were at it. أهلاً بكم. وأنا كل شوية بهدد المجلس الأولمبي اللي عندنا. أنا أنا جاي أغير كل حاجة في مجلس اليوم عندنا. And after just one season, we were one of the most watched shows in Egypt. Around August 2012, we decided to take it to the next level and aimed at producing Egypt's first ever live show with real live audience. Ladies and gentlemen, John Stewart! <laughs> After just the second episode, we became the most watched program in the Arab world with an estimated viewership of 30 million people. Bazoum saved his best material for former President Mohamed Morsi. Look at what Morsi wore when he received an honorary doctorate in Pakistan. Now look at how Bassem portrayed it on the air. Bassem was accused of damaging Egypt-Pakistan relations. 
Egyptians across the country laughed themselves silly, but Morsi was not amused by the hat joke. A warrant was issued for Bassem's arrest. He was formally accused of insulting the president and insulting Islam. On the 30th of June, people took to the streets to overthrow the Muslim Brotherhood's regime. And Bassem was now faced with a new reality that he should continue with his message of satire, regardless of the circumstances. <laughs> And after one episode of the program, the show was taken off the air by the broadcasting channel. Former friends became today's enemies. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the John Stewart of Egypt, Dr. Bassem Youssef. Hey. Hi. Bonjour, Bassem. <laughs> I would like you to actually repeat all that introduction with your French accent. I'm like, I'm in love. D'accord. Uh, Alors, I'm going to do my French accent. OK. I'm okay. very happy. <laughs> yes. So let's finish the story. OK. OK. So uh, yeah. Oh, well, uh, well, it was very interesting to see that the same people would react to a different joke. So uh, basically, people who liked a certain joke didn't like it when the joke turned on them. And it just like uh, showed how strong satire and, and, and comedy was. Uh, we were always up and trying to break and disrupt taboos concerning political, social, and sexual uh, issues in, the, in, in our countries. And um, we had some difficulties with the religious regime, and then we had some difficulties with the nationalistic regime. So we continued to broadcast under uh, a lot of pressure. And uh, we fought, and we continued to fight until I lost my show. So that's uh, exactly what happened to the show. Yes. OK. <laughs> right. Yes. So I just want to do a little more flashback. Yes. Because you were a heart surgeon. Oh, yes, yes. Before Any, this. Anybody with a medical emergency, don't come to me, please, <laughs> for your own safety. Yes. So yeah, yeah. what is that made that complete shift in your life? Well, well here's the thing. Uh, at that time, I was actually uh, I was fed up with the medical system. I really wanted to leave. And I, I did all my uh, medical exams in, in, in America. And I wanted to go, and I got accepted in Cleveland. And when you're, you really want to go to Cleveland, it shows how desperate you are to leave your country. <laughs> but out of all places, I'm very sorry. If anybody here from Cleveland, please could forgive me. And um, it's just like, anyway, it's a very depressing city. It's anyway, uh, yeah, anyway so, uh, but then the revolution happened. And at that time, people think that this was just like um, a trial, that uh, we were just like having fun. As a matter of fact, at that time, in 2010, 2011, there was hardly any original content for uh, digital platforms in, in Egypt and in the Arab world. Hardly anything. This was basically the most independently produced uh, digital product. And the idea behind it is that we wanted to put that in order to invite more talents on the on, on digital internet in order to curate them, to be, be an excellent curator, and, and to switch them into mainstream media. Mm -hmm. So, the first thing that went in went viral. I thought I would have maybe 10,000 views. I had 5 million. And I was like, seriously? And, um, uh, and that was the idea behind it. We wanted to get more people on the digital platform and change the perception of how people view content. And then the rest is history, and many people followed. And so that is when you started to tickling the oh, yes. giants? The, by the way, this, uh, this is made by the lovely Sarah Taxler. She is. Uh, a senior producer at uh, John Stewart show, The Daily Show. I, when I went there first time, she's like, I want to do a documentary about you. She's like, yeah, okay. <laughs> and then uh, she'd been following me for two and a half years, and the movie will be actually released uh, in Sundance in, uh, in January. So stay tuned, and uh, I'll give you free t-shirts if you come. Yes. <laughs> right. OK. So through all that shift, you stay connected with your community. So what was the role of Twitter in this metamorphosis of yours? I have a confession about Twitter. So at the beginning, at the very beginning, the, the company was like managing everything. I didn't know what is Twitter. I, don't, I didn't see the point of using 140 characters. I mean, why? I mean, wh what is the, and then there was Vines. And this is like kind of like, are you doing, is this ADD? This is like very short. I, how, why would you use that? And then, and then I said like, OK, you know what? I want to have a crack at it. So I remember my first tweet ever. It's like, guys, I don't understand. What is this? Can you please help me? So people started to help. It's like, OK, what's the next question? What the hell is a retweet? So people helped me. And then I was actually connecting with people. And with that personal connection, the number of followers 
just like jump because people can see that they can actually connect with the people, that, the person that they follow. And, and as a matter of fact, now I actually use Twitter more than the other mediums. I mean, I, I thought like, okay, let's get, Facebook is enough. Because, you know, 140 characters for an Arab, we like to elaborate. We like to lose our hands. <laughs> so 140 <laughs> characters is not enough for us. So okay. suddenly now it is actually more than enough. And uh, you're having wonderful products, yes. Awesome. Yes. Awesome, awesome. Awesome, awesome, yes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so you tackle topics which at least create debate. Yeah. At the most, hate yeah. and anger. Mm -hmm. So how do you handle all this on Twitter? And how do you turn that debate into real productive conversation? Well, any human will have, if you posted like a, a post and you have like 10 comments and one of them is hateful, you'll, rem you'll forget the other nine. You'll just like focus on the negativity of that. And that, that is really crippling. What I did at the beginning with that, when I didn't really understand, if buddy, uh, somebody would actually send me like hate tweets, I would just respond. And I didn't know that you're actually enforcing and you're empowering that. So I learned that to enforce the positive messages. So, and, 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 and I have to differentiate between critics and between trolls. And, and you know that, and you need to listen to the people, but you know when is that tweet is actually had context and can be useful for you or for, for you modifying them because we listen to the people all the time. Twitter gave us this window of actually staying connected to our fans and to the fans of the show. So it's about like how do you manage the, 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 the explosion of emotion of Twitter and choose what is best for your show and for your content. So this is how we managed it. Great. Yes. And so more globally, like if you compare Twitter to all the digital use, usage and or platform you have, hmm. what is it that Twitter is bringing that is unique to you? It's, it's what? Unique. Unique. Oh, it's, it's, it's so what? French. Oh. Amazing. I love it. <laughs> so it is very fast. It is, I mean, when I want actually to check something, I go to Twitter first because okay. it actually, it became basically the main source of news. As a matter of fact, it's a little bit embarrassing, but many of our news outlets would actually get news from fake accounts and from parody accounts, and they would actually look extremely stupid, and that would be more content for us and more material to make fun of. Yeah. But uh, Twitter is really out there, and uh, if you want to know what's the score of the game, you go, to, you, you go, you go for it. I mean, that's your first destination. And uh, if you want to actually to verify certain uh, uh, piece of information or news, we go there. So it makes us actually more connected to the news and actually to verify uh, many of the um, fake news and information that we, we get uh, in order not to be embarrassed in our own show and our content. Of course. Yeah. So you are actually um, like, well, you've seen Periscope? Yes, I've seen, as a matter of fact, um, Oh, are you going to periscope us yeah, now? Yes, I want to periscope you guys. So uh, would you please smile to the camera and say hello? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh, my God. That's so cool. <laughs> I am periscoping. That now that's a verb. OK, so that's good. And why are all these people joining? I have many hearts. OK, <laughs> thank you. And we're stopped. Now can you pay me as you paid Ellen DeGeneres? We didn't pay <laughs> You didn't? No. Okay. Damn. All right. All right. <laughs> so, back to your serious question. Periscope. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, Periscope would yeah. have been an amazing tool yes. during Arab, Arab Spring. Yeah, because as I told you, people like followed, people were following uh, Twitter like crazy during the Arab Spring. So, if you can follow that with live video feeds, this, is going to, this was going to be like a, a portable news station with every person. Mm -hmm. So I think it would have actually um, added a lot of, um, yeah, a lot of weight to, to the events at that time. So I okay. think uh, it would have made like a huge difference. Okay. Did you have a only on Twitter moment? Yes, only on Twitter moment. So the first time I went on John Stewart, so you know, I was happy being on a foreign channel. And then I started to have all these tweets from the States. I'm a local, uh, personality in the Middle East, and suddenly all of these people are like, oh, you should be the next John Sears. Like, oh, I, I, got, I started to get connected to people that otherwise I would not be even in touch with. And then um, as George, uh, John was leaving, they said, like, 
hey, we want you to be the next John Stewart. And I got so excited, I got my hopes up, and then they gave it to Trevor Noah, but that's okay. <laughs> All right. I mean, I'm fine with it. It's like, uh, I've, I'm over it, and it's like, yeah. <clears throat> I mean, I'm, right, a, so I'm, I'm African too, you know, like, <laughs> but that's fine. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, so as a user, like, who do you follow? I like to follow the news, so I follow comedy shows. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so fortunately for the people who are sitting in this room, networks, producers, digital creators, they're gonna, back, they're gonna go back home to their house, uh, hopefully without tanks and rifles. Yeah. Um, they're gonna start and create and continue to create their shows. What would be your advice to them? Well, as you said, like, t Twitter is not a replacement. It's kind of a, comp it complements the whole uh, watching experience, the whole viewing experience. I w if I would like had my show now with all of this like Periscope and the, the, the video, I would actually uh, be more uh, interested in creating original content for Twitter because th when people were watching the show, it, they were not just watching the show, they were watching the show and like live commenting on it. You could, some, when we were on, sometimes you would not even need to watch the show. You would follow the show and the jokes and the events over Twitter. So with that power, I think you, people should make more use of using that medium in uh, promoting their content and actually get people more engaged in, uh, in their uh, uh, streaming content. Okay. Yes. And so, Bassem, um, yes. what is the next step for you? Well, I think we're back now. If, if I cannot do the show, I think we should back, get back to square one. Is about inviting more talent on the, uh, on the digital platform. I mean, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Middle East, but I think the Middle East is the most underutilized, undercovered, uh, highest potential area in the world. I think this is like the only undiscovered territory. We have a huge gap between producing and consuming uh, 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 content in internet. And I think I want to actually give the same chance that I was giving, going from a nobody to a television personality. I want to give that to millions of, of, of uh, people out there in the Arab world, and believe me, there are amazing talents waiting to be discovered. All they want is like a path to be discovered, and we are working very hard on that digital platform to, so, and this is gonna be a digital platform that could not be shut down by a decision of whatever authority there. It could not be shut down by a phone call. It could not be threatened because it's everywhere. So I'm, I'm really hopeful about this. All right, so we're gonna finish with one question. Yes. So, uh, in the Middle East, mm -hmm. four years ago, there seemed to be a lot of hope. Yes. And now, yeah. well, hope. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So, <laughs> um, do you think it was all really worth it? Well, revolutions are not events. They are a series of processes. It's a process. It is something in the making. You know, the fact that the revolution were, as you speak, is defeated, this is not the end. The revolution is happening in the minds and hearts of so many young people right now. What happened gave an incredible potential for people to question everything. And questioning in and itself is a revolution. We have 70% of the population in the Middle East under uh, the age of 40. And that's uh, like an incredible power waiting to be unleashed. I think we have not seen the end of it yet. And I think there's gonna be more to come. And I think the uh, amazing creativity that we have seen in the last four years is going to be put in, uh, in good use. And I think the revolution is not defeated. And I think, again, there is much, much, much more to come. All yes. right. Thank well, you. thank you very thank you. much, Bastien, for this. Thank you very much. <laughs> and so, no, thank you very much for attending. Um, Au revoir, merci. Bonjour. Merci. Oui, oui. A tout à Go in the conference room, in the speaker's yes. room, ask your question, <laughs> uh, hashtag TV times uh, hey, Twitter. You, you, you we'll try that, to answer all of it. Uh, Thank you so much, guys.